So a warm welcome and wonderful morning here in uh, Berlin at the World Health Summit. We are very proud to have this extremely important and exciting topic on this um, round table uh, discussion round. And um, we have a lot of speakers, so we have to be crispy. But we thought it's such an important issue that we get a broad overview about these complex topics of um, research and development, unmet needs for medicines, and alliances, um, strategic alliances to solve these issues. We will start with a short introductory remarks about EDCDP, and I will not go into any details by uh, Michael Makanga. And um, before we really start, let me just introduce myself. My name is Stefan Kaufmann, and I'm from the Max Planck Society, where I um, am director at the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology, exactly here in Berlin. And again, a warm welcome, and I think I should not spend any more time, and let's just go into the middle of it. Can I have the first slide to just um, see our program that you get an overview and you just uh, look at it while Michael will take over the stage. Michael. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yep. So this is our program. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Michael Makanga. I'm the Executive Director of EDCTP. And in the next few minutes, I will quickly take you through uh, how the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership is involved in tackling uh, and met medical needs of vulnerable and neglected, pop uh, neglected populations. This is a program that has been running for the last 16 years. It's a program that has been running for the last 16 years, and in the next few minutes, I'll only focus on the last four years, uh, which is part of the uh, partnership that is involving European countries, African countries, and uh, co-funded by the European Union as part of the European uh, Horizon 2020 uh, program. EDCTP as an organization works in an integrated, with an integrated approach of accelerating medical uh, product development on the diseases that are on the outer circle. And as you can see, this calls for uh, cross-disease uh, cooperation and also making sure that the necessary capacity is developed as well as the networking across the board. In the last uh, couple of years, since we started the next program, we've been having incremental investments in the area of research and development in the development of medical interventions, and uh, we expect by uh, 2020 to have committed uh, close to 760 million euros towards this area. The medical interventions that are uh, supported as part of this program constitute uh, the major investment, taking research and development, taking 88% of our investment budget, and this is mainly supporting late stage de development of products, most of these uh, being phase four, phase two and phase three clinical trials, where we, are where we have 60% uh, of our portfolio in this uh, area, and 16% uh, supporting the post license uh, phase four studies, as well as product focused implementation research. We are also paying special attention to some of the target populations like wi uh, pregnant women, newborns, and um, studies that are involving children are constituting about 36%, adolescents 43% involvement, and we currently have 32 African countries that are involved in the program. These are the countries that have clinical trial activities, but our activities are spread out in 37 countries. We also support the accompanying capacity in terms of human resource development, systems development, and some of the um, other areas that are like strengthening the regulatory capacity as well as uh, networking of institutions uh, through the regional networks of excellence. 
I want to emphasize the role of international cooperation in the work that we do. And as I said, we are having, uh, now we have about uh, 57 countries that are involved in the program, 37 in the African side, uh, 20 on the European side and other global partners. But what is key is the networking that is happening at all levels, uh, south-south networking, north-south networking, and north-north networking. Here I've only picked on the example of Germany and three countries from each of the regions of Africa to see, to show you how much this is important in what we deliver. And with this in mind, I want to introduce our next two speakers. And the first speaker is uh, Angela, uh, Dr. Angela Lewis, who is coming from St. George's University, London. She's a senior academic lecturer and honorary, uh, an honorary lecturer in the infectious diseases consultant uh, in the United Kingdom. She will be talking to us about uh, reducing advanced deaths in Africa, in low and middle income countries through the DREAMS program. We'll be hearing about, her, about that. And uh, we'll also be hearing from uh, Professor Gerard Wazel from South Africa, one of those collaborations from down south, uh, Cape Town, who will be speaking to us. Uh, Gerard is uh, the head of the research group uh, of immunology at the Univers uh, University of Stellenbosch in, Sa in South Africa, and he's been working uh, a lot in the area of TB and diagnostics and prognostics. Gerard will be talking to us about tackling unmet needs for tuberculosis diagnosis, looking at the tools for an imperfect world. Uh, if we start off with Angela, please take the floor. So thank you very much, Dr. Makanga, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. So I'm the lead of the DREAM project, and I'm presenting today on behalf of the DREAM consortium and also the three African PIs, Dr. Kanyama, Professor Mifananga, and Dr. Kwanfak. And at this conference, I've been reflecting on what the DREAM project is. In essence, it's a project which is aiming to reduce deaths from HIV-related meningoencephalitis, but there are a number of other facets. It's also an important vehicle for the evaluation of new diagnostic tests. We're also doing capacity building for frontline healthcare workers. And lastly, through the collaborative efforts with uh, my African colleagues, we've actually come up with a model of care for advanced HIV disease for some of the sickest patients. So patients presenting uh, with symptoms of meningitis presenting to hospital in resource-limited settings. So I'll start off by explaining why we need to focus on HIV-related meningitis. I'll then uh, give an outline of the DREAM project, explain why it's such a unique approach, talk about two of the interventions within DREAM, notably the DREAM training program, and also health system strengthening, which is essential in, as part of this approach. And I'll finish by outlining many of the diagnostic tests that we're evaluating within the DREAM project. So why study HIV-related uh, meningitis? So we all know that meningitis, and in particular cryptococcal meningitis, which is due to a fungus, together with tuberculosis, are the leading causes of HIV-related deaths. And if we group together other causes of meningitis, so meningitis due to tuberculosis, bacterial meningitis, and meningitis or meningoencephalitis due to the parasite toxoplasmosis, we're talking up to a quarter, if not a third, of HIV-related deaths. And it's important to stress that, sadly, this problem is not going away. In particular, for cryptococcal meningitis, it suffered from a myth, the myth that it would go away like it did in the West. You roll out antiretroviral therapy, and the problem goes away. Not so. That's data that is um, across clinical trials, and within the DREAM project, three-quarters of our patients are ART-experienced. So sadly, this problem is with us to stay for the immediate future. In terms of what's available for these patients, the situation in resource-limited settings remains wholly inadequate. Lack of access to diagnostic tests, treatments, 
and also the know-how of how to use those tests and drugs in such a way that uh, deaths are avoided. So for example, for cryptococcal meningitis, the leading cause of HIV-related meningitis in many settings, the only treatment may be fluconazole. And we know that the three-month mortality with this drug, which is ineffective and in inadequate, is 70%. So we're really at a watershed moment here. We have new data from the ACTA trial in particular that gives us new uh, and safe uh, combinations of treatments that can treat cryptococcal meningitis in particular. There's new guidance from the WHO on cryptococcal disease and packages of tests and treatment for advanced HIV disease. And we also have initiatives such as that from UNITAID, which is making available diagnostic tests and treatments for cryptococcal meningitis in particular. What is lacking are models of care so that access does reduce deaths. So when I designed the DREAM project back in 2015, I was unaware of how different the approach was. And the aim that I had was to bridge the gap between clinical trials, where some of the data often gets stuck in very prestigious journals. But when you go to many of the settings, particularly hospital settings in resource-limited settings, um, actually little has changed in the last few decades. So it's an implementation project well, we've mixed clinical trial methodology. We have hard clinical endpoints, two and 10 week mortality, and we're mixing um, mixed methodology in the mix. So there's social science, uh, um, co-designed education programs, health economics um, as part of uh, the methodology. And it very much speaks to the latest guidelines on advanced HIV disease. So packages of tests and treatments for some of the sickest patients, point of care tests done by the bedside, optimized treatment regimens, and health system strengthening that I'll come to shortly. And through our efforts, we have come up with a model of care uh, for patients presenting to hospital uh, with uh, advanced HIV disease. So here's an outline of the project. There are three phases to the project, observation, training, and implementation. And we're aiming to look at, to, to demonstrate a reduction in mortality between the implementation phase of the project and the observation phase. During the observation phase, looking at very few patients, we wanted to get a snapshot of existing mortality, what access was there or not to diagnostic tests and treatments, and what was the health system um, available. We're working in three African countries, Tanzania, Cameroon, and Malawi. And I cannot stress enough how important the African leadership is. So through long-standing research collaborations, we started with these, but we linked into the clinical directors of the hospitals, people who are often not involved in research, let alone its implementation. And we involved ministries of health from the outside of the project. And I also want to highlight that we're also collecting prospective ep epidemiological data on the causes of meningoencephalitis in these three different settings, which surprise, surprise, we're finding is different and is essential in terms of informing Ministry of Health for the need of diagnostic tests, treatments, and training. So here are some of the dream interventions. I'm going to focus on the training program in particular and health system strengthening, but also to highlight that there are two interventions that just take time. And these are laboratory capacity building. So we've focused on rapid diagnostic tests, but we've looked at, we've looked at strengthening the whole laboratory system. So going back to the traditional microbiology in parallel. There's no point doing bedside diagnostic tests and these tests not being uh, available uh, for the laboratory technicians. And also we've created pan-African communities of practice so that there is ongoing infectious diseases and mentorship. So in terms of the training program, this is an open access resource, which has been viewed approximately 2,000 times, downloaded over 1,000. And this was a training program that was co-designed with the whole consortium and in particular the clinical directors. And they were very clear. They told us we don't want theory. So what we have, we do have some theory, for people who want to look at it, and many of the doctors do, 
but what we've done is that we've created workshops around interventions that reduce mortality. So how to give a drug safely, I'll give one example of that shortly, how to perform one of the diagnostic tests, in particular the cryptococcal antigen lateral flow assay, which has revolutionized the diagnosis of cryptococcosis, and we also have some posters. So here you can see Sister Bupe, who's one of the senior nurses in a secondary level hospital in Mana, and this is one of the training materials that we devised together with um, her hospital director, Dr. Shimwela, and she's in the meningitis room that I'll come to shortly. It's important just to stress that this uh, medicine, amphotericin B deoxycholate, is a very effective drug, but given um, inappropriately, so not on the, on, during the right time frame, or it, without laboratory and clinical monitoring, can be fatal. So these uh, trainings are very essential in terms of making sure that access to drug does reduce mortality. <laughs> so I mentioned the <coughs> meningitis room. And just to really just touch upon briefly, because I don't have much time, on what I mean by health system strengthening. So prior to DREAM, what happened to patients was that they would go to the ward. They, we had two sites uh, where we collected data in 75 patients. These were sites that had been involved in research prior, and we found, uh, this was research uh, driven by my colleagues at NIMRI, that one out of 75 patients had a diagnostic lumbar puncture. All patients were treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics and also a high-dose fluconazole that we know is inadequate. After uh, a lot of consultation, in particular with the African leadership, which meant that the algorithm became the standard of care, we um, established a <laughs> we established a diagnostic and treatment room, which is in the outpatient, outpatient area. So patients are pulled. We know that time is against us when we have a diagnosis of meningitis. Patients are pulled from the triage area into this room. They have rapid diagnostic tests done there. And on the basis of these, in parallel with traditional microbiology, so we haven't forgotten about the local micro microbiology that's needed, and treatment is instituted in this room. So reducing time from patient presentation to diagnosis, which is microbiologically driven, and treatment. And just to raise some of the questions in terms of what you need to think about when you're talking about health system strengthening, particularly for the laboratory in this case. So it sounds quite simple, we're going to give rapid diagnostic tests, but questions arise. Who does those tests? Is it doctors, nurses, lay people? Who is responsible for the storage of those tests? When we talk about room temperature, if that's 40 degrees, you need air conditioning. And that's what we installed in the meningitis room. Who's, who's responsible for making that each, make sure that each batch has a positive and negative control each time a batch is opened? And how are results are communicated? And what we found was that the training program was an important vehicle for imparting knowledge, but it was really about local engagement and facilitating uh, communication, in particular between clinicians and laboratory technicians, where often the communication was in some cases, non-existent. Lastly, I'd like to finish by highlighting how DREAM is an important and powerful vehicle for the evaluation of a number of diagnostic tests. So the main one is the semi-quantitative CRAG LFA, and that was the call that we responded to for EDCTP, but we're going much further. These patients have got bacterial sepsis, and the role of bacterial sepsis is not clearly defined. We're also looking at using gene expert ultra, which is more sensitive uh, for the diagnosis of HIV-related tuberculosis, uh, meningitis, uh, uh, apologies, and also looking at the seroprevalence of toxoplasmosis. So really unique epidemiological data in three geographically distinct um, settings, which is perhaps unsurprisingly lacking since most research is disease-specific. So. I, Yes, just wrapping up, thank you, sorry. So just in terms of summary, the DREAM project is a number of things. There are a number of components. And I think that a number of these key tenants, the African leadership, um, the moving from having a paradigm shift to implementation projects where we implement what we know, we focus on the how rather than the what, 
and we nest research questions within that construct, I think that is an important way forward. We need to continue in terms of advocacy for diagnostic tests and treatments, and um, we work together within the Cryptomag group. We've got a crisis in terms of the key drug, flucytosine, affecting us in quarter one of 2020, so that's really important. But really, the health system structure is really essential. The frontline healthcare workers and their leadership are essential, not only for advanced HIV disease, but for pandemic preparedness, for eradication of NTDs, non-communicable diseases. And I think we really need to uphold uh, the leaders working in these communities and the frontline healthcare workers who are serving their communities. So it remains for me to thank the Dream Team that I have the privilege of working with and to thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to hear from anybody who thinks that they can take parts of the interventions that I've outlined further. So for example, e-learning modules for the training program and also ministries of health and funders that would be interested in scaling up models such as Dream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, we'll go on straight to hear from Virat, and the question will be taken afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Makanga and Professor Kaufman for the invitation. Much appreciated. Um, I, I know what to say, but I'm not sure that you'll be able to see much. Okay, is all right? Ready to go? Okay, I'm going to talk about TB diagnosis. And um, a few days ago, the 2018 WHO TB report was released, and we are sitting on 10 million new cases and almost one and a half million deaths. And the striking thing is that a few countries and three regions, WHO regions, carry the bulk of the burden. If you look at India and China together, over 30% of the burden. India has more than a million cases, new cases each year, I think 1.3 million cases. Um, all those countries are um, developing countries, and their healthcare systems are certainly very different to what you would find in Europe or in North America. And that uh, brings me to the point that I think that the countries with well-developed healthcare systems are in a much um, less urgent need for new tools than these countries. The current tools are clearly not sufficient to um, deal with the TB epidemic in these particular countries. So. Um, uh, I don't want to be flippant about this, but I'm not sure that Europe and North America needs anything more than gene expert and, and culture and drug sensitivity testing. But that is not good enough for these countries. The other important point I want to make here is that we are dealing with a lot of missing cases. There are several million cases that we never pick up due to our poor um, tools, uh, particularly in these high incidence areas. And this is demonstrated by a study done in South Africa where, where we have, although we only have um, 53 million people, we have almost 600,000 new TB cases each year. And the shocking thing is that about half of those people get cured. Although we have a perfectly good uh, treatment and uh, the drug resistance rate is not higher than, than elsewhere, but every step of the way, we lose patients. 14% never even get tested. And that's because of our healthcare system and the accessibility to healthcare. You have people w living in small villages uh, far away from a health um, post. You have many people living on farms where there's inadequate health um, surveillance, etc. So, And people have to travel on their own cost to a health center to get tested. And if you are very poor, as a lot of these people are, you have other problems than coughing up a little bit of blood. What am I going to eat tonight? Am I going to be able to sleep safely? So health does become a less important uh, topic. After being tested for TB, 17% never get diagnosed because they don't return to the clinic to get their result. 
Um, and 13% and of those who are actually diagnosed are never notified. And 27% of those that are notified actually complete their treatment. So we're dealing with 50% of all TB cases that are actually cured. And I think that is a shocking indictment of our healthcare system. Now, the tools, of course, regarding diagnostics um, are problematic. One of the oldest tests still in use, the sputum smear microscopy, has a sensitivity of merely 60% and requires skilled people who uh, stare through microscopes all day to detect the few um, acid fast bacilli. Culture is the gold standard, very sensitive. It can be done automated, but as you can see from that uh, midget instrument, that is not going to make its way to a peripheral healthcare post. It takes six weeks before the re results can be reported as negative. And if they are positive, you need to do speciation to show it's actually TB and not another bacterium. Gene Expert has been a real um, revelation. It has uh, sped up the diagnostic process. After two hours, you can get the result. And although South Africa has a, a truly remarkable rollout of Gene Expert, as you can see um, on that slide, you also will appreciate that there are many, many areas that do not benefit from Gene Expert because the population density may be too, too low in those areas. There are no uh, regional labs available. So somebody li li living in, in the center there without any gene expert will wait more or less two weeks to get the result. So that is clearly not good enough. So that's why we are working on biomarkers. So biomarkers are any biological indicator that uh, of a normal biological process or a pathogenic process or a response to an intervention. And the idea is that, as you can see from that PET-CT image that is not showing very well with this light, um, there's a lot of inflammation going on in the lung. And you see a biopsy there, of multiple granulomas in the lung, and you see a macroscopic image of a um, caseating, uh, cavitating lesion. So the idea behind this is that in this immune process, um, cytokines and inflammatory markers will be secreted, released, and make their way into the blood. And if we can measure those, the body will be able to tell us if um, a particular um, condition is pre present or not. Fever is a, is a biomarker. CRP that we often measure, that's a biomarker. So what we did in um, a series of studies funded by the EDCDP with northern and southern partners, um, we looked at people presenting with symptoms compatible with TB. Over a thousand of these people were um, investigated. So they come with cough plus another symptoms like uh, shortness of breath or night sweats or weight loss. And we then do the, the standard tests, the composite diagnostic, which includes x-rays and sputum culture and gene expert and treatment response, and compare that to our biomarker um, that we are investigating. We looked at more than 70 markers in serum, and we found that there are indeed um, markers that really discriminate between TB and the other lung diseases. The other lung diseases are, are normally acute exacerbation of uh, chronic obstructive airways disease or uh, viral bronchitis, bacterial um, infections um, other than TB. So although the median values for these individual markers uh, differ dramatically, you will appreciate that there's a lot of overlap. Um, and if you look at a single marker, um, it will not be very useful to differentiate between TB and other diseases. If we, however, combine markers, in this case a seven marker biosignature, we reach a sensitivity of about 94% and importantly a negative predictive value of 96%. Now that is good enough to be a screening or triage test. So that would be a uh, perfect test. That would be a useless test. So our, te our individual tests are somewhere between excellent and useless. Um, probably not good enough for clinical implementation. But the combined signatures we um, do feel have value as triage tests. So over these uh, about 12 years, we have moved from um, one consortium to another, all with African and European partners. And we have looked at serum, we've looked at multiplex cytokine arrays in the first assays and 
and uh, identified the signatures that we would like to take forward. In the subsequent um, consortium, we converted these uh, to finger stick tests and very primitive lateral flow devices. You can see there in the middle a, a strip with a control and an um, antibody against a particular marker. Um, six markers there, and uh, we put the blood in a buffer and measured this with a, um, a simple um, benchtop device. And now we are funded uh, since October the 1st by the EDCP to actually take this further. Now we have a closed system, a closed cassette that measures the levels of three different markers. And that can be measured actually with a battery operated handheld system. And we believe that um, the implementation of this needs to be evaluated in, in our current study. At the same time, the EDCDP and the Gates Foundation are co-funding a large treatment response study that is also based on uh, biomarkers. So this is the current approach. This is where uh, we think the triage test will help. So currently, if we take 100 patients and they come with the symptoms that we um, use in our large studies, um, about a third of them will have a positive gene expert. And two thirds will have a negative kind of wasted gene expert. And the issue is access. So people have to get up early, travel far, pay a lot of money, stand in the queue, get their sputum taken, sputum gets sent away, and they have to come back subsequently to get their test result, and many people don't. So the triage test, however, would take those same people, and if positive, would indicate quite a high risk for active TB. Um, and importantly, a negative predictive value of 95 or 96% if the test is negative. Now, we think that such an approach can have many positive benefits, Namely, it will reduce the number of negative confirmatory tests by up to 65%. With substantial cost reduction from uh, 12 euros for the gene expert to, to 2 euros for this test at the moment. It will um, simplify the logistics of um, the diagnostic workup. And importantly, we think that both the patient and the healthcare worker will be alerted to a high risk for active TB when this triage test is actually positive. So if, if I hear that I have a very high chance to have active TB, I will be more motivated to come back to have the confirmatory test result um, um, available. And similarly, the healthcare worker who is used to the situation where most of my tests that I send away come back negative in any case, will know that in, in, in the positive triage test, the chances for a subsequent confirmatory test being positive is much higher and will probably take this more seriously as well. Now, and additionally, accessibility is important because this would be lab-free, 20 minutes to a result, minimal training. Um, we can um, build in things like uploading results to a cloud. Um, this can be a handheld device carried into the farms for the farm workers in small villages. Um, Michael, I didn't overstay my time here, did I? You did, not, 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 almost, yeah. Almost. Um, my helper also seems to have disappeared. He did not interfere with you, so. <laughs> no, no, but he has disappeared. Hmm? And it's not that one. Hmm? Because I'm coming up to the most important slide, which is the acknowledgement slide, right? Thank you, yeah, that's fine, yeah, thank you. So, in summary, finger stick biomarker signatures seem promising, high sensitivity, lowish specificity makes it a triage application. Um, I haven't shown you how difficult it was to move from Luminex to ELISA to point of care to smaller signatures. It took 10 years. Um, we are busy looking at global applicability of such a test and we need to build this into diagnostic algorithms. We are somewhere here in the middle, um, small-scale manufacturer, uh, manufacturer and uh, clinical um, assessment. Um, and our funders, EDCDP, have uh, um, really helped tremendously in, in this uh, four um, consecutive grants in the EU. 
Um, this all started with Stefan Kaufmann and um, a Gates-funded project, the so-called GC6 project. I think Srimanta Parida, the uh, long-term, long-time uh, project manager, is also in the audience. So from this project, these ideas were developed and led to these consecutive um, consortia, African-European tuberculosis consortium, the Screen TB consortium, and now uh, the current one is the Triage TB consortium. Um, I also want to specifically acknowledge the Leiden University Medical Center, Paul Korschens and Annemieke Hulluk, who are responsible for the lateral flow test development. And that's all I have to um, Thank you. show. Thank you. Time flies. Time flies. And I hope my micro is on. Uh, time flies. So we will have the questions. I would have liked to ask really questions to you, how you what you expect from all these global alliances and um, activities, but I think we have to go on and see how the uh, time is then ready for the questions and answers at the end of the story. So I, can't, I go on with introducing our next speakers, and the first of the next series of speakers is Catherine Ohura, Global Health Innovative Technology Fund, and we look forward to what you want to tell us about these issues. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Ahura. I'm with the GHIT Fund. I um, have been leading the GHIT Fund since uh, six months ago. Um, and I've been in industry, actually, so pharmaceutical industry for about 20 years, concentrating on R&D. So I have that perspective coming from industry as well as R&D, um, just so that you have a little bit of background on myself. So today, again, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity to kind of share what's out there, what you know, kind of innovative ways, if you would, uh, that there are out there, and one of the examples is what we're doing um, at GHIT. And uh, the kind of title kind of says it all. Uh, it's really about thinking outside the box and thinking innovative, uh, innovation. And uh, so how are we doing that is kind of what, what I wanted to focus on today and just share that with you. I can do this. Uh, so it's, again, as I mentioned, it's about innovation uh, in our mind. And when you say innovation, it could be, it can mean different things. It could be R&D, it could be new drugs, new diagnostics, new vaccines, et cetera. So of course, that's innovation. It could also be innovative financing. So thinking outside the box in terms of how can we uh, think about financing um, R&D in uh, NTDs and neglected areas. Um, also, again, open innovation. It's, it is about the new products um, and how you develop them. And finally, it's about uh, in access and delivery space. How do you partner uh, with these uh, various partners that are out there in terms of access and delivery? Because at the end of the day, without the drugs reaching those patients, it's, it's really not going to mean much, um, even if you have uh, all these new products. Um, so those are kind of the, the themes, if you would, that uh, if you can keep that in mind throughout the presentations and uh, how we're approaching that from a GHIT perspective. So again, just a little bit about uh, what GHIT is and how it's composed, and it kind of touches on the financial, uh, innovative financing model. So this, um, I love this slide, because in, in one slide it kind of shows the uniqueness, the innovative um, approach that we're taking at GHIT. And as you can see, 50% of our organization, of our fund, is funded by the Japanese government. So I know I saw some uh, Japanese <laughs> government officials here, but uh, they're the funders. Um, the Foreign Ministry, MHLW, uh, as well as UNDP are the funders of the GHID Fund. So that's unique in itself. But what makes it truly public-private partnership is that private piece also, right? So if you look on the right side of the, the circle there, uh, we have, as you see the logos, pharmaceutical companies that fund uh, the GHID Fund. So it's truly a collaborative effort uh, really looking at that one goal of uh, trying to get uh, innovations in R&D into the much needed neglected space. And finally, the, the other 25% of the private piece comes from the Gates Foundation and Welcome Trust. Uh, so as you can see, this uh, combination, truly we're working together in achieving this. I think it's, it's quite unique uh, in itself. Um, again, very proud of uh, Japan kind of coming up with this, um, with this idea and the commitment of the government uh, as well. 
And you see on the very bottom the sponsors. And uh, these are not pharmaceutical or healthcare related sponsors, as you can see. So what are they contributing to the GHIT fund? It's more about the infrastructure. It's about services that you pro they provide uh, that we also collaborate with them and take um, utilize. Um, so they support us, for example, with uh, law services, public, you know, public uh, PR services. Um, so you see ANA, so airline services. So all of these uh, collaborations, I think, is key and our strength in the GHIT fund. And the second I talked about open innovation, it is about providing that platform of open inv innovation. So we provide uh, Japanese technology or Japanese uh, organizations to work with non-Japanese organizations to have these new innovative uh, products, specifically in drugs, vaccines, or diagnostics in neglected areas. And when I say neglected, I mean uh, malaria, TB, and NTDs. Um, so how we kind of create that platform so that these companies or these organizations can work together um, and otherwise, they really wouldn't invest uh, their money, if you would, in these areas because there's nothing uh, that comes out of it. And that's kind of where we come in uh, to play, to fund these organizations to do the development um, in these neglected spaces. So that in itself is providing that open innovation. Um, again, that uh, collaboration is, is key here also. And here's uh, just in a nutshell, a uh, portfolio of the GHID fund right now. So these are all the organizations and products that we, that we fund. And as you see on the left side, you see the therapeutic areas that I mentioned earlier. So malaria, TB, and NTDs um, at the bottom. And if you go from left to right, uh, you see from early space going all the way to lay development. And our target is to reach um, regulatory approvals. Um, so you'll see the, the vast pipeline, um, if you would, on here as well. So I think execution is key. So it's really not just about thinking outside the box and of course coming up with these ideas, but it's really executing um, is one of the, the themes um, also are necessary, um, things that we need to think about. So GHIT, while we don't do the actual clinical trials, et cetera, we're funding. However, we also kind of play a key role in just making sure that these um, execution takes place. So we are integral part of, of the teams, if you would. And just to share a little bit about the late development uh, products, and I just uh, selected the three that you see here. Uh, the most advanced right now is the TB LAM uh, diagnostic test for TB, as you see on the very right side here. Uh, it's a collaboration partnership uh, work with Fujifilm and Find. And um, as you see, this uh, collaboration piece is, again, the key, and you, you keep seeing this theme over and over again. Uh, because without that, it's, it's quite difficult to, to proceed. Uh, we also have PZQ, and I'd love to highlight PZQ, the Praziquantel, if you would, uh, because it is in partnership with EDCPP, actually, um, uh, co-funding, which I think is also a unique model, right? So funders and funders co-funding uh, a project, if you would. So that in itself, I think, is a unique financial uh, finance, innovative financing model um, that we can take away from. And finally, the Mycetoma uh, product, again, a partnership. So these are the three products that are in late development right now uh, that I just wanted to highlight real quick. And a little more about the, the TB LAM project or the product. Again, it's a diagnostics urine, using urine. So you see the picture there um, of what the, the te test kit actually looks like right now. Um, so this is the, the product that, again, in a collaborative way, and remember I mentioned about execution earlier, so it's not just about funding these uh, projects, it's about actually getting results and getting these products out um, to get regulatory approval, but also to the patients. So that's an example um, of a product. And as I mentioned, the Prezaquantil, again, this is the pediatric Prezaquantil um, project that, uh, again, you see the, it's kind of difficult to, to see the size there, but right now the adult size of Prezaquantil is quite large, actually. Uh, for small children to take. So that's where the technology, a Japanese uh, company, Astellas uh, Technology, came into play and uh, created this pediatric uh, praziquantel uh, formulation, was that, which is absolutely critical and a much needed uh, product. And just to touch on the strategic partnership with the access and delivery, I mentioned that uh, very earlier. Um, this is also critical. Again, you keep hearing the partnership piece and an innovation piece, but there's several parties, um, partners that play in this access, uh, play, access play, uh, platform. How do we connect them? So maybe there are outside the box ways to connect different parties 
um, how do you connect them so that these uh, patients get access to these products? Uh, so that thinking outside the box piece, I think is also critical. And uh, we also take a top-down and bottoms-up approach, and let me just explain a little bit about what that means. The top-down is more general, you know, in terms of access and delivery, what kind of platforms can we create more in a general sense? Whereas the bottoms-up approach is using products that we fund, actually like the TV lambs or like the, the PZQs. From those uh, products, can we create the pathways in terms of access, and can we kind of create an archive or a database, if you would, of these pathways uh, that other organizations who are developing TB diagnostics or praziquantel or NTD uh, products can kind of follow suit. Um, so that's another area that we're trying to contribute, if you would, not just directly to the products, but also creating that platform or the method, if you would, of uh, providing, delivering these products. And so that's a top-down and bottoms-up approach. The top-down, uh, we do, I, I mentioned that it was a general um, effort, but it's really in collaboration with the Japanese government there as well as UNDP. So again, collaborating uh, to create that platform in access and delivery also is what we're working on. And as I mentioned earlier, we are the R&D uh, piece, uh, the GHID is the R&D piece, um, is our strength. So that's kind of where you see the, not the dollar sign, but the yen sign. That's where I actually provide the funds. And the latter um, access and delivery piece is we play that mediator role, if you would, to create those partnerships. Um, so we don't provide direct um, dollars, if you would, but it is about the connecting the dots is, is the role that we play. And with that, again, this is just a take home uh, that we really strive for, that health is, is a right, not an option. So in order to do that, what can we do? It's about thinking outside the box and really making, making those connections and execution. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have to go on immediately and have time to, so that we have time for questions on the, at the end. So we move from the GHIT to the GFATM, the Global Fund um, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And our next speaker is Peter Sands. Thank you. Well, this should be a little change of rhythm because I don't have any slides and we're not an organization that does any R&D. Um, the Global Fund, for those of you who doesn't know, is the largest funding mechanism in global health. Um, we are deploying about four billion a year at the moment to fight the three biggest infectious diseases, AIDS, TB, and malaria. Is this not working? Do you have slides? I have no slides. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> I have no slides. I have a fancy computer here, but no slides. All right. Let me just we can just leave it. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we spend a, we're, in, we're deploying about four billion a year at the moment, um, and following the successful replenishment that just happened in Lyon earlier this month, we will be stepping that up to about 4.7 billion a year. Now, we can achieve an awful lot with the tools we currently have to save lives and alleviate the suffering of people affected by AIDS, TB, and malaria who are disproportionately the poorest, most vulnerable, most marginalized in the world. However, we can do a much better job um, if we have more innovative diagnostics, drugs, ways of actually reaching and serving the people at need. So I just wanted to offer um, four quick observations about things I think we need to do collectively to make this happen. First is a very simple point, which is that uh, private companies that innovate aren't naturally inclined to spend their R&D dollars on diseases that affect the poorest people in the world or very small communities. The math doesn't work. Um, and so to address that, this is where the role of organizations like GHIT or the um, malaria fund, the E malaria fund, which I think will be talked about later, are absolutely vital, or Unitaid for that matter, um, because we need other sources of money that stimulate the innovation for need which doesn't generate a massive economic um, return. And we also need creative vehicles to actually bring that through to market, whether it's advanced market commitments, um, volume guarantees, 
all sorts of different mechanisms by which we can make it more attractive for private sector manufacturers to actually get involved um, in producing these sorts of um, medical products. The second thing I think we need to do better in, um, and this is something we're sort of investing quite a lot of time thinking about at the moment, is how do we get the feedback loop from what's actually happening in the field in fighting diseases back to those who are doing the R&D to be better and more systematic? And that's not just a challenge for the Global Fund, it's something that Sumio at the WHO is deeply involved in, and um, various other partners. I think the dimension that I'm particularly focused on, though, is how we get the input from communities of people who are actually using these um, medicines into the R&D discussions. Because quite often, the real problem when you actually get something out into the field is not actually the bioefficacy or whatever um, particular property of the medicine. It's basic things such as you were talking about, um, Professor Waltz, like logistics. If the person can't actually get to where the diagnostic tool is, then it's not going to be much good. Um, and there's lots of very, very practical considerations about the nature of different um, pharmaceutical products that sometimes I think get lost in the long loop from the person who actually has to use it to the lab in which it's being um, developed. My third observation would be that sometimes we forget that um, biomedical innovations often require operational innovations to actually make most impact of them. You can't just take a new innovation, pop it into a current sort of treatment regimen or a current normal practice of how, and expect to get the full uh, benefit out of it. And a, a good example of um, something we're doing around that at the moment is um, self-testing for HIV. Um, part of the um, new set of catalytic funding, the Global Fund will be um, rolling out as a collaboration with the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which is all around the integration of self-testing um, with national treatment programs. And the whole idea is to be addressing a basic problem, which is that self-testing is all very well, but if somebody tests mm -hmm. positive, you need to have a pretty well-worked-out answer to the question of what do they do then? Because simply having people being tested as HIV positive and having no easy way of linking them into treatment doesn't achieve very much. Another example I'd highlight, you know, one of the great success stories of the fight against HIV is the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. We've gone from having about 1% in Eastern and Southern Africa um, of pregnant mothers having prevention of mother-to-child transmission treatment to well over 90%. But if you look, y you'll still see huge differences in actually the efficacy of the treatment regimens. Um, and when, it, when you look at them, they're actually doing roughly the same thing with the same drugs. The protocols are very similar. But one of the big drivers of difference is community involvement. It's things like um, uh, mother mentor schemes, where mothers who have been through it buddy up mothers who are going through it for the first time and help them through the the whole process and ensure treatment adherence and so on. And then a last example of um, innovation around the way we do things coupled to innovation um, around bio the biomedical aspects would be the example of um, TB missing cases. Um, absolutely we need um, easier, cheaper, more accessible diagnostics. That would be the single biggest thing that would transform the um, fight against the TB. So the stuff that you mentioned and um, the GHIT um, stuff, I think, are, are enormously exciting. But the other big innovation that is really making a difference um, on closing the gap between those falling ill with TB and the numbers who are actually diagnosed and treated is actually innovation around working with private sector providers. In many countries in which TB is highly prevalent, actually most people's interaction with the health system is with the private sector. And if, if the national TB programs haven't worked out a way of um, incentivizing private sector providers to be part of the broader fight against TB, then you're, gonna, you're not going to win. Um, so I, ju I just want to stress the fact that innovation, we need all the biomedical innovation, but alongside it, 
we need the innovation in the way we do things so as we maximize the impact of those biomedical innovations. And then the last observation I would make is, um, please, can we do things faster? Um, I don't really come from this world. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I um, trained as an economist. I worked in McKinsey. I ran a bank for a whole um, period of time. And the thing that I am struck by is that too often we have great things, great tools, powerful tools, even powerful tools that are FDA approved and they've got the WHO guidelines, and we're still not using them. And there are hundreds of thousands or millions of people who could be benefit, and we're still not getting it um, to them. And sometimes the money is a problem, um, but sometimes actually it isn't the money. It's a whole slew of reasons around local treatment guidelines. Oh, we've got stock of the old stuff, so let's use that up first. It's um, doctors um, just l like to keep the way they... I mean, we've seen this in... in, in very real, we've been pushing very hard on um, tra um, transition to um, dolutegravir, the TLD. Um, we've seen it in the uptake of shorter treatment regimens on MDR, which we're the largest financier of. Um, and w I just think that through the system, we've got to think more creatively and more with more urgency about how we collapse the time between having brilliant innovations, and there are fantastic things coming along, and how we actually get them to the people um, who, who need them. And I, I don't think we often, we, we should have it behind our thinking all the time of what the cost of time is. Uh, one, one um, we do an analysis of sort of life saved of that the Global Fund has um, saved since its inception, and we do this with our partners and with independent experts and all this sort of stuff. And as of end of 2018, that number was 32 million lives saved since the inception of the Global Fund. But the, the number that really strikes me is that between 2017 and 2018, that number went up by 5 million. That works out at 15,000 people a day. And it sort of puts a focus on the time it takes to convene committees to change guidelines or to get things into them. When you're thinking that actually one's talking about whether it's 15,000 people a day whose lives you're saying, or 15,100, or 15,200, and there is that real sense of urgency. And I think that is something that collectively we need to really focus on. Is, and there's no one actor that can do it. WHO plays an absolutely critical central role in this. We play a role as a funder. People who are developing this private sector, all sorts of people play a role. Collectively, we've got to find a way of making this ecosystem more responsive to the needs and simply just faster at getting the products to the people who need them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, two wonderful presentations about funds. Um, how they go on in the pipeline. We now go to the intergovernmental organization, and there is only one real intergovernmental organization on that topic, and that's the World Health Organization. And we will now, um, in, I will now introduce Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, the chief scientist at WHO. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much um, for this panel. And I think my remarks would follow on quite well from, from what Peter um, was just saying. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in WHO. And uh, as uh, Safan mentioned, I'm the chief scientist and honored to be the first chief scientist in WHO. Uh, we have a newly created science division uh, earlier this year. And really, the, the thinking behind that was twofold. One that WHO should be ahead of the curve in terms of harnessing the potential of emerging technologies and new technologies and really making sure that we're harnessing those for public health and public good. And secondly, to ensure that all the guidance and the normative work and the standards that WHO does, which uh, as you all know, is, is, is it is the major UN agency doing normative work in health, 
that it's, it's efficient, it's highly scientifically, technically, of course, excellent, but also responsive and timely. As Peter was saying, I think time is of the essence, and we are looking now at an end-to-end -end process, even within WHO, to see how we could best capture the new innovations that are happening around the world, and there are more and more funders of innovations around the world, whether it's GHIT, whether it's um, the big grand challenge funders, the big philanthropists, um, but many of them end up sitting on the shelf or undergo a small pilot study, but don't really result in any kind of uh, scale up or impact. So one of the things that we're looking at is how do we really bridge the gap between uh, the, the funders of innovation, the entrepreneurs uh, all around the world who are thinking about these things, but then taking it through the process of evidence generation of doing the clinical trials and the clinical studies um, to generate the evidence that's needed in order for WHO to then make policy guidance to countries, which then enables ministries of health to really uh, invest uh, uh, and scale up. And I think it's also important to look at what Peter was mentioning uh, even beyond the stage at which a product is pre-qualified by WHO is in the policy guidance, you still have a situation where a large number of countries um, find it difficult uh, to scale up. And that's where working with policymakers very early on to prepare the ground for the policy that's coming to, to do the additional studies. A good example is a malaria vaccine that uh, you know, has taken 30 years, GSK and other partners investing to develop. But today we're in a situation where uh, the public health policy guidance could not be uh, determined, even though it has regulatory approval from the European Medicine Agency. And so we, we're still doing the implementation studies in three countries, which will ho hopefully give us the data needed, not only on efficacy and safety, but most importantly on how it can be programmatically delivered uh, to young children. Uh, and have an Im whether it has an impact on, on in the real world on mortality, uh, which we expect it will have, uh, in order to then move it into policy guidance. If we had anticipated this possibly 10 years ago, we could have started in parallel with the phase three uh, clinical trials, some implementation research um, studies. So as, as many of you probably know, the WHO led along with 12 other multilateral organizations, the Global Action Plan, uh, for Healthy Lives and Well-Being, the SDG Gap, uh, which was initiated uh, or presented uh, last year at the World Health Summit, and then last month the report was presented at the UN General Assembly. And, and one of the, um, uh, the premise of the SDG Gap is that the world is off track to attain the SDG 3, and what do we need to do collectively, the multilaterals, the funding agencies, most importantly working in partnership with countries to accelerate the, the rate of progress in many of these, whether it's TB, malaria, NTDs, but also I think we mustn't forget about non-communicable diseases and other uh, big killers of people today in the developing world, road traffic injuries, uh, mental health disorders, suicides, et cetera. And one of the accelerators that was identified was the, uh, um, so there were seven accelerators identified by this uh, group of organizations that could help achieve the H SDG3 if we put a lot of focus on it. And one of it, w one was on data and digital health and one was on uh, R&D innovation and access. Now again, just to give you an example of what WHO can do uh, in this area is the R&D blueprint, the WHO R&D blueprint for priority pathogens. Now this came out after the West uh, Africa Ebola outbreak, the realization that we were completely unprepared globally um, for an outbreak such as that. Uh, we didn't have the diagnostics, we didn't have the tools, drugs, et cetera, and the realization that this could happen uh, with new pathogens in the future. So the priority pathogens list that was developed by WHO, which includes Ebola, but also Lhasa, Nipah, MERS, uh, uh, some other hemorrhagic fevers, but also disease called pathogen X or disease X, which is the big unknown that could arise uh, and, and affect. It could be uh, something like a flu pandemic, but it could be something completely that we can't even think about today. How do we then respond globally? And we can only do that if we are prepared. And so the preparation uh, involves really, um, it involved the R&D developing a blueprint uh, or a research roadmap. What would you need to tackle a particular disease? 
You need diagnostics. It's been mentioned that we've, the, I think we've neglected diagnostics. And without diagnostics, we can't do good surveillance. We, don't, we will not have good data. Neither can we do the clinical trials for the new vaccines or the drugs. So you need diagnostics. And then, of course, you need drugs and you need uh, vaccines um, uh, for, ma for many infections. Uh, it's, it's relevant. So with the current Ebola out outbreak, we were able to then test the investigational Merck vaccine. And a second vaccine uh, manufactured by J&J is also going into, into clinical studies. This in the midst of an outbreak in a highly uh, conflict-ridden and, and a very difficult environment. And it was only possible because we were prepared. There were partners on board, academic partners, partners on the ground, very important that this all be led by people within those countries, DRC in this case, and, and, and the funding was put in place. Gavi had the stockpile of the vaccine. The regulatory networks had been activated in advance. So there's something called the emergency use, uh, pre-license emergency use of uh, products which could be done in emergency settings. So a number of different um, uh, things that needed to be addressed in order to actually during the outbreak get this done. And so we're following a similar approach now with Lhasa fever in West Africa, where we brought together many countries to develop a common plan, including epidemiological studies, which would enable the deployment of a, of a vaccine when it's, uh, that CEPI is funding, and that would be ready in a couple of years. Nipah in uh, India, Bangladesh, and, and in that region, um, and so on. So, so key here was WHO actually taking the lead on, on developing the roadmaps and also developing uh, the product profiles for some of these uh, uh, products that would be needed. And I think it's important to also, um, what Peter was saying earlier is that the input of the target populations I think is important to consider when you're developing a target product profile. What is that test that would make it a game changer for tuberculosis, for example? Um, of course, we, we want to know its sensitivity and specificity, but we also know that we want a point of care test. We want it to be possibly uh, done by a community health worker, uh, the results available very quickly, and so on. So articulating all those needs in a product, product uh, prof profile helps manufacturers, helps startups and entrepreneurs, and also helps funders to fund the right kind of innovation. When you know what's needed by the, by the world, then you, you can focus uh, funding um, on that. And we now have a directory of uh, about 210. Um, it's a health product profile directory that was developed by TDR and is now hosted by the WHO R&D Observatory. But if you go there, you will see that most of them target the neglected diseases, TB, HIV, malaria. And we mustn't forget now that today the world's uh, the biggest burden of disease is non-communicable diseases. So I think when we talk about neglected diseases, it's also about neglected uh, populations, and, and their, their needs now go beyond these infectious diseases. Um, a word on access uh, was also mentioned. I think in, very important to link in innovation is useless unless it, it ultimately leads to access. We had a, a number of workshops last year along with the Wellcome Trust to, to discuss this further, and it was a, a lot of country uh, policymakers, researchers, et cetera, giving inputs into what is really needed. Uh, again, in the research ecosystem, I think like EDCTP has really empowered researchers in countries to tackle the issues which are important for them. And very often, the global funding landscape um, sometimes is not aligned with the priorities of countries. So I think it's important really for us to think about how global funders can better coordinate themselves to make sure that the priorities articulated by the lower income and lower middle income countries are addressed, but also that there be a good global access policy. And we've started work on that. It's, it's, not, it's a complex subject, but at least we believe that wherever public funds are going into R&D, that there should be a, a, an access policy that's considered right from the very beginning, from preclinical and phase one. By the time we come to phase two and phase three, it's too late to start talking about access. So hopefully that will provide some um, uh, principles that uh, especially public funders of R&D could put into their uh, contracts and their uh, grants as they, as they fund, uh, uh, fund innovation. Because we've seen now medicines that cost $2 million and so on. 
and uh, unaffordable even to people living in high income countries. And I don't think we want to live in a world where we finally have cures for all diseases, but they're unaffordable. And, uh, and finally, I want to just say a word about um, the lack of uh, integration really of data systems and, and digital technologies into health systems. We now live in, uh, we've seen that when you have a focused funding for innovation, like you have for immunization, for example, or for TB or HIV, you find innovations reaching people much more quickly, and you also find that a vertical system then gets developed, which is not necessarily linking up with others. So I, I hope that one of the things that we will do now, working with, again, with all these 12 multilateral agencies and other partners, um, is to look at how data systems can be, can be integrated, going away from vertical systems uh, into, into more integrated um, into data systems, and also that digital health technologies become an integral part of health systems, but again with the focus really on trying to improve outcomes and, and not just an adoption of digital for the sake of uh, digital. So thank you very much. I think I'll limit my... Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumya, for the Tour de France. And we are still not at the end. we going on with a very national presentation, Professor Veronika von Messling from the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in German BMBF. And um, thank you so much for giving your presentation, last not least. Thank you. Well, thank you very much as well for this opportunity to speak in this uh, circle of experts and I think many of the ideas that we discuss and talk about um, have already been mentioned so let me see if I can maybe provide the more governmental perspective German governmental perspective to some of the things that were said I guess we all know and agree that there is no progress without innovation and so for us as a ministry that funds research in Germany Innovation in all its diversity and forms is really a principal outcome for all funds that we support or funding schemes that we support. And when we look at, um, oh, all right, okay. So <laughs> when we look at um, the sustainable development goals, it is clear, equally clear that innovation and especially health innovation is a prerequisite for the success. and. The most obvious for SDG3, the aspiration that we will provide health and well-being to everyone at all ages. And I think this is not just, this is easily said and it's really difficult to achieve, but, but we should really try. And, and as a government funder, we, we have to do our part, or we want to do our part. So um, it is important to discuss how we can bring this innovation especially to the vulnerable and neglected populations. And I th if some of you think that, why do we focus on this group, then just maybe think that in face of a multi-drug resistant bug or a, an emerging pathogen, all of us may quickly become part of that group. And I think this realization has led to neglected uh, tropical diseases being one of the main objectives within the SDG3 efforts. So. Um, I can see that we and our, this is why our ministry really focuses a lot of their um, research efforts in global health at, to this topic of neglected tropical diseases. S the one aspect that I would like to bring forward that has already been mentioned at uh, several instances is that um, what we're talking about is a marathon, not a sprint. So for our government, it is really critical that uh, what we do is a long-term commitment and that we are seen as a reliable partner in these efforts. And this is why we strategically invest in these um, product development partnerships, just like EDCTP, but also others that have been mentioned, as these are vehicles that allow us to live up to this commitment. The next point is, it really isn't anything that you go about alone. And so it's a team effort. That means we need to partner, and I think that's also something that's been coming up again and again from different perspectives, with, with all kinds of, of, of partners along this process. And so um, 
It is, it is politics, but it is civic society, it is private funders, and all these different groups may have different motivations and objectives, but they all share this common goal. And so we need to find organizational structures that allow us to, on the one hand, pursue our objectives, but on the other hand, move them towards the common goal. And I just would like to mention GARD-P, the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership that was jointly founded by WHO and DNDI and that has been supported by us and other uh, governments to really have achieved the goal to develop treatments for specific indications and to make them available to everyone who needs them. And another example that I think very much illustrates the spirit is ZEPI that has already been mentioned here as well, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which really was created by a number of governmental and non-governmental funding agencies to rapidly develop vaccines against such emerging pathogens as they have been mentioned. S and the three years into its existence, ZEPI is really well on its way. And I think our expectations can be fulfilled if we continue to support them and continue to remove the barriers to success as they come up. And I think that has also uh, come up again and again here that whenever we move a step forward and we achieve one of these intermediate goals, we do realize, okay, so what's the next step that we have to take? So I think that that brings me to my last point, which is that our, so to say, old way of looking at processes and then kind of having them move step by step by step, that's not wrong. But in this situation, we really have to take a systemic view on things and we have to think it from the end result that we want to achieve and that is not just having a product on some shelf, but like actually with the patient. And what that really means is that application to the real world has to be part of the development process from the very beginning. I think there's this fancy word in other areas, it's called in design thinking. So we have to, or thinking by design. And um, that also means we have to take aspects outside of the research realm into consideration, cultural aspects, aspects of the end user, like who is going to take it? Is, and, and this is why I really like this example with the small pill. That actually makes all the difference. If the kid can't swallow it, it can be as great as it is, but ultimately it's not getting in. So this really is something that is new to our classical community that we support, our research community, but Without doing this, we will not be successful. So I would, and, and, and we are actually trying to put this, all these words into action. And one of the um, initiatives that I would like to mention here are the research networks for health innovation in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we not only ad support addressing regional issues, but also actually having local PIs being in the lead of these initiatives. So we not only address the issues that are at the heart of those communities, but we also build capacity in being able to play an active role in addressing them. And, and, and that is exactly what we want to achieve. We have another program that was essentially started last year in the context um, um, of uh, last year's World Health uh, Summit, the Global Challenges Africa, where we will support mother and child health research projects, again in Sub-Saharan Africa, and again with the local PIs in, in the lead, not only in the lead of doing the work, but also in the lead of planning these processes. So just let me just finish with saying that we're really convinced that SDG3 and actually probably many more of these uh, um, SDGs can only be achieved if we work together at eye level. And that means we need to work together across disciplines, across countries, and we have to truly recognize that each contribution is equally valuable and necessary to ultimately achieve the goal. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor von Bessmessing, and we really appreciate the, uh, the way that you've ended it up, really emphasizing the end-to-end -end thinking in research and development, putting the, the end user 
in mind. And the last infusion uh, in design thinking. I think that is something that is we need to think about. Uh, we've had different perspectives from the different uh, speakers and I really want to thank all our speakers uh, for the excellent presentations. Uh, our time is up, but I just want to take two, strictly two questions, one from a female and one from a male. <laughs> Any burning questions? There is one there in the middle. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll take that question. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful talks and the discussion. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, she mentioned about the anticipation of the diseases which, or any of the health challenges which would come in the future. Uh, so what exactly is being done in, towards building uh, a better anticipation of what's coming in? Uh, and also about the point that um, the last speaker, she mentioned about that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon, but how many people would be able to survive the marathon if it's not anticipated? So I think a comment about that would be great. Thanks a lot. By the way, my name is Jubin. Thank you. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you for that question. It's really uh, an important one. It's not something that any one organization or agency can, can address. So I think the first thing is really to raise the awareness that the, glo the world is not prepared. And I don't know if so how many of you have seen the, the report um, from the Global Monitoring Board that just was also released at uh, the UN General Assembly last year. This is a very high level panel that reports to the Secretary General. Basically the message is the world is not prepared for pandemics, for outbreaks, for emergencies. And, uh, and therefore there are a number of uh, actions that have been recommended. But I think countries need to start improving. They're very basic things and I think we can link it all back again to health systems and primary health care, because I think the, ultimately the outbreaks get out of hand when they're not recognized, when the health system is weak, when people don't have access, when there are no health workforce, they're not properly trained, you don't have data information systems. So it's, again, a question I think of, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros always says, I think that health security and UHC are two sides of the same coin. And unless we think about really strengthening health systems, and in particular strengthening primary health care, which means having uh, not only the infrastructure, but the human workforce that's well-trained and, and can look at these, uh, anticipate these problems. And so governments need to invest uh, in, in these systems, um, which will ultimately help build that strength in surveillance and security. But then at a global level, also, there's a lot that can be done. And one of the things we're working towards is, uh, is a more discussion and debate on data sharing. Data sharing, including the uh, pathogen sequence sharing, pathogen sharing we've seen now with um, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the national legislations that sometimes it's becoming difficult for scientists to share, share the sequences or share the pathogens. And we've had several cases in the last couple of years where influenza um, uh, viruses have not been shared on time, and that's resulted in delays in the influenza vaccine development. As you know, every year, twice a year, the WHO makes a recommendation on which strain is to be used for the vaccine. So starting from influenza, but then going to TB and, and other diseases, I think it's important for us to have a global consensus on how we work together. So there are many areas where we do need a global consensus rather than fragmentation, which seems to be happening today. And um, then, as I said, a focus on how you actually link innovations to access, uh, how to build incentives for the private sector, uh, and of course, also for publicly funded uh, R&D. So I think actions that your question raises a lot of in issues, I can't address all of them, but certainly we need to start thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samia. Um, Sorry, we'll not uh, take any additional. Okay, we'll take your, since it's the female, we'll take one last question. Yes. Thank you. My name is Sonal and my question is to Peter. Um, I, I think the most important uh, point you raised is about time, running out of time. But one of the issue is, as a civil society representative, government usually listens to a large-scale donors. And um, 
I, I have heard you often saying that we are, we, are, we are only a bank and we are not a policy organization, and so we won't push or talk about um, technical aspects. And, and I, I see that there is a lot of potential in Global Fund in doing that, but if that is not the role Global Fund would want to take, that it, it can lead to a problem. So I just want to hear your res response to that. Uh, it's a good question. Look, um, we're not the technical organization. Indeed, one of the reasons we have such a deep partnership with the WHO is because WHO is the normative um, technical organization. Um, on the other hand, we are an impact-focused organization. Um, and what we will do is have a, a pretty robust discussion with governments um, that if they're not doing the things that are sensible to do from a point of view of saving lives, alleviating suffering, reducing infections, either because there are treatment guidelines but they haven't implemented them, or because there are non-biomedical things like um, discrimination or criminalization or other barriers to accessing health, um, then absolutely we will have those kinds of um, robust um, discussions. Um, and I think all of us engaged in this have to um, keep the focus on what is the ultimate outcome in terms of how does it affect the people who are being affected, either by non-communicable diseases or infected diseases, but always it's very easy to get sucked into thinking about progress by um, measurement of inputs, more clinics, more clinical health workers, more diagnostic machines out there or whatever. Actually, we always wanna be coming down to the fact that are we saving lives? Are people healthier? Are families healthier? Um, and that's what we've got to, we've got to always have that at the back of our mind. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, as we close, I just want to ask our speakers to s uh, state just the one thing uh, that you'd like the audience to take home, taking into account what we've discussed uh, on vulnerable populations and neglected populations, really uh, improving and accelerating research and development. Just one thing, the one thing that you want the audience to go home with. Just as horses are for courses, diagnostics are for specific situations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think for us it really is that we are interested in the end result. So we have to talk to the people who are going to be the end users if we want to succeed with our efforts. Thank you. Um, so I would focus on local leadership and health system strengthening in terms of uh, innovations and their implementation. Thank you. So I would say think outside the box. As I uh, mentioned earlier, the technologies, the partners, the processes, the government policies, all of that may already exist. It might be just a matter of connecting different dots. So really thinking of it's out of the box. I would say think about access from the very beginning when we have the idea for a new product. We should think about how it's going to reach people in the most uh, vulnerable and remote settings. I made the point about urgency, but just in case you weren't listening, um, <laughs> I'm gonna make the point about urgency again. There are still far too many people, particularly in the poorest, most vulnerable and marginalized communities, dying of diseases they don't need to die of. Um, and we, sh we shouldn't be letting that happen. Thank you very much for the pointed messages. And in closing, this is also what inspires the European and developing countries clinical trials partnership with the end-to-end -end, uh, support for research and development, putting the end user in mind. And with this, I want to thank you all for your participation, and I want to uh, ask my co-chair to say a few words in closing. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and I won't say many words because we are um, in time, and that's wonderful. So what I want to say really is a very simple word, and that is, Thank you. Thank you to the speakers and the discussion. Thank you to the audience. It was a great, great uh, meeting and uh, the importance of the questions that we had, of course, deserve also a great meeting. 
Um, I looked into the audience, I saw nodding heads, I saw some critical heads, but that's, that's, that's what we want, actually. So thanks to all. Now, before we leave, uh, I have a very small amount of announcements, and I want to, let, um, to draw your attention to a short presentation on a new kit of the on the block, the EU Malaria Fund. Those who have to rush out have to rush out. Otherwise, I give the word, words to um, the, the stage to Holm Keller. And once more, thank you for uh, your interest. Yeah, thank you very much. I am aware we are in between uh, your lunch, so we want to be very quick. This is about a novel intervention that could help overcome certain market failures. Developing a new vaccine costs more than a billion. This is usually not financeable for tropical diseases. So in the moment, a fund is being conceived called the EU Malaria Fund, which will tackle exactly that situation by providing non-dilutive venture loans to companies. These are loans that only need to be paid back in case of success and maybe forgiven in case of product development failure. We are expecting to launch this fund within the next months. We are in the closing proceedings. All the partners are considering their options, most notably the European Union, but also um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is considering its participation, find many substantive partners who are involved in fixing these market failures have come together here. You can find information on the EU Malaria Fund and how to participate on the www.controlmalaria.eu website. And the reason why we are here today is to welcome your input. Please get in touch with us with any comments and suggestions we have in the moment. There is a special gratitude to um, the European Commission's um, DG for Research who has made tremendous efforts in the domain and has been spearheading that effort. There is a great thanks to the World Health Organization, notably to Pedro Alonso, who has helped define the need. Um, there is a great um, thank you to the state of Berlin, who is in the moment considering to host this important global initiative. So go on our website, please have a look embark on the discussion. All the thoughts are still open and your input is more than welcome. Thank you very much and buon appetit. Thank you.